Okay, cheap ass lower for intro, here we go! I am Ninja. My parents are the heaven and the earth. My home is my body. My power is loyalty. My magic is training. My life and my death is breathing. My body is control. My eyes are the sun and the moon. My ears are sensitivity. My laws are self-protection. My strength is adaptability. My ambition is taking every opportunity with fullness. My friend is my mind. My enemy is carelessness. My protection is right action. My weapons are everything that exists. My strategy is one foot in front of the other. My trust is in Quan. My way is the way of the tiger. Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry, and it's time once more, after a brief interruption and a restart, for The Way of the Tiger. Now, there's been a few little hiccups in this session, so I'll just quickly explain. Um, Rolls.org, my random number generating, random dice roller website of choice, appears to be down at the moment, and I don't know why. Unfortunately, Rolls.com, with two L's, a website that appears to sell prams, baby buggies, um, push chairs, you know, things like that, appears to be the only thing that wants to turn up on search results. I do hope that Rolls, the baby pram and push chair place, hasn't bought out Rolls, the dice rolling website, because uh, that would be a bit of a pain. So unfortunately I'm going to have to use map tools for the dice rolling tonight. Now, I am not a massive fan of map tools dice rolling because map tools has a, a bit of a problem with sticky dice, right? They occasionally get stuck on the same numbers and have a tendency to repeat rolls a little bit from time to time. If that becomes the case, there are a couple of ways to fix it, but it is what it is, you know? So, I get to close these now and hope that rolls gets back up at some point in the future. Also, there's some rolls website that's for, like, for selling Rolex watches and stuff, so there's other things that... It's just weird. It's unfortunate because I wanted to record this episode earlier and I didn't get to. Just quick check. Yep, yeah, all recording, all good. So, when last we left it, I had recorded a very long session uh, with a lot of it admittedly going over the rules at the start of the game. But I've done that now. That's in the first episode. And I'm sure you can go back and watch that if you need to. Don't worry, I'm not going to be repeating rules every episode. We're going to be getting back into the action. Also, I'm going to be aiming for shorter episodes. Um, purely because the last one was lengthy and actually only covered about two-thirds of the material I'd like to. So, what did we learn last time? Uh, Yemen, the Grand Master of... Was it, was it Grand Master of the Flame? Has stolen the scrolls of Ketsuin from the Monastery of Quan. And we, Avenger, are out to defeat him. He came and slew our foster father 
the Grandmaster of the Winds, was it? He murdered him and stole the scrolls. We are the new Grandmaster of the Winds, or whichever Grandmaster we became, fortunately. And we are going to press onwards. Now, this is an interesting encounter. So, uh, Glavis the Ranger has us on his ship. This ogre is huge. Um, actually, the first time I played this book, when I was like 14 or 15, I believe I died facing the ogre. I made a mistake during the fight, and it proved to be basically fatal. But we'll discuss that when we come to it. Also, we can go look at the Ninja Code in section 177 anytime we want, but I am also using it as the intro at the start of these sessions with the um, soundtrack music for the series. So hey, yeah, let's let's have some fun. So this is for Way of the Tiger, and yes, yes, it's very easy to go, yes, I am a ninja, but it's more to it than that. You know, you're a member of a monastic order on a holy quest to save the world. And, as I mentioned before, while I'm not a massive fan of Save the World type quests, it doesn't matter if you're actually going to save the world or not. What matters is that... Yeah, it doesn't matter if I believe if, if I'm actually going to save the world or not. What matters is that I am playing a, a ninja warrior monk who believes that the world will fall into ruin if he does not complete this quest. And the reason that matters is that he is a religious character with deep devotion so obviously he has a distinct desire to see all this done you know so oh, of all the times to yawn then again it is like 6.38 in the morning so didn't get to record this earlier but I did get to do something else which was quite fun which uh, might even feature at some point in future videos the ship which Glavis has chartered, the Aquamarine, has a hundred oars and two masts. The winds are kind to you, and you as you scud across the azure plain. The sea is so calm that after two weeks without the tang of salt spray on your lips, you forget that it is composed of water at all. The oarsmen row for ten hours a day, but they are free men, not chained to their oars. Two bear the scars of a pirate's persuader, captured by buccaneers. They are of the lucky few who have lived to see the sky again. All of them have the upper body of the oarsmen. Some who turn to the sea for their livelihood too young are squat and misshapen, moulded by life at, at, blah, molded by life at the oar into grotesque travesties of the mountain dwarfs. The land of plenty passes to the south, and you are in sight of the isle of Ma of the magical goddess when the lookout cries a warning. The helmsman steers a new course and the drum beat quickens as the oarsmen redouble their efforts. The ship that is approaching is long and low, painted green and red, flying a red pennant at the top of its mast. Glavers standing next to you at the rail says, that ship is from Port, from, that ship is from Port of Rivers. We'll never outrun it. I can't remember Glavis's voice from the last episode, sorry about that. So saying, he draws his sword. The oarsmen strain, sweating with effort, but they cannot outmatch the pace of the slaves on the reaver's ship, galvanized into the frenzied s Blah. The oarsmen strain, sweating with effort, but they cannot match the pa the pace, not peace. They cannot match the pace of the slaves on the reaver's ship, galvanized into a frenzied spurt by the barbed whips of their overseers. And a full stop so I can finally breathe. <laughs> <laughs> At last, the captain gives the order to prepare to repel boarders, and you ready yourself for combat. The pirate ship carries a spiked ram, but they are obviously trying to take the aquamarine as a prize for their grapple. As a prize for they grapple and come alongside. The reavers carry scimitars and chain nets and are led in their rush to attack by a nine-foot monster whose body is covered in nobbles of misgrown bone, an ogre with a large spiked hammer. The aquamarine's crew are no match for the battle-scarred buccaneers. Will you leap into the rigging and hurl a shuriken at the ogre or attack the ogre as it comes aboard, flattening a section of the aquamarine's rail? Right. 
we don't get a lot of opportunities to use shuriken and we have five it will be quite some time before we can replenish them but now might be a good point however I am aware that at one point later on in the adventure there is a single opportunity in combat to throw free shuriken so we must not go below that number so yes I will leap into the rigging not climb not clamber but leap and hurl a shuriken at the ogre oh yes because that's a ninjury thing to do right yeah your shuriken glints in the sun as it hurtles towards its mark in the ogre's chest as you leap down from the rigging a volley of arrows is let loose from a stern castle of the reaver's ship the ogre grunts in pain as the shuriken lodges in its chest throw one die and take the score from a huge beast endurance of 16 absolutely so that's five knocked him down to 11 and we haven't even started a fight yet oh yes However, we also have used one of our five shuriken. They are now gone. Well, that one's now gone. One of the pirate's arrows is coming at you. Do you have the skill of arrow cutting? That's a very good question. Yes, I do have the skill of arrow cutting. Magnificent. So, 380. Uh, I've got to say... Uh, arrow cutting is one of the most enjoyable skills, at least in the first couple of books. And there's the section where we can throw free shuriken, so let's not look at that one now. The arrow reaches you as you're in mid-air between the rigging and the deck, but you whip your hand up and snatch it out of the air, inches from your, before your chest, and throw it aside. The ogre, enraged, raises its spiked hammer to smash you. Will you try the winged horse kick, attempt the iron fist punch, or slide across the deck and use the dragon's tail throw? Now, just as a reminder for us, that would be the winged horse kick, that's the, the back kick rising up, the, the iron fist punch, which is a fairly straightforward punch, or the dragon's tail throat. Now, when I first attempted this one, I made the mistake of attempting to use the Dragon's Tail Throw on the Ogre. Now, back at the beginning, when we were sparring with Gorobei, well, it wasn't really sparring, it was a competition. Uh, if we attempted to throw him, it would have been very difficult because of his oil and grease, but not impossible. Attempting the dragon's tail throw on the ogre is not only impossible, but you end up lying in front of his legs and underneath his big spiky hammer, and you get smacked. Yeah, that hurt me so much that he then defeated me during the rest of the fight. So I'm not going to attempt the throw. I think I'm going to try with a punch first to see how his defences are against a punch. So, 310. I might want to uh, bookmark this at some point, maybe, so that I can zip around faster. Your clenched fist, or blah, your clenched fist, audibly parts the air as you drive it towards the ogre's body. His defense against the punch is four, which is really low. So, two d six to attack, and that is definitely higher than a four. So we have connected with our punch. I'll close this now. Uh, D6 damage for a punch, so up to uh, two points of damage only, reducing the ogre to nine endurance, so he is definitely still alive. Therefore, he attempts to crush you with his spiked hammer. Your defense against his ponderous blow is eight, meaning he needs a nine or more to hit, which is good for us. He got a nine or more. Okay, and his damage is two dice. I think I'm going to try and block this one. Uh, right, we're in 310. I'm going to open book 2 because the rules are the same, so I don't lose my place there. And find the... Where are we? Punch, kick, where are we? Come on, it's... 
block. Da 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 da. Been roll two dice. Okay, so my defense was an eight, so he needed a nine or more to hit me, which means I need a seven or less to block it. Um. Yes. You know, that's reasonable. I'll attempt it. I successfully block the attack with the iron rods built into the forearms of the ninja suit. Right. Chang! And stagger under the blow. This, of course, throws me off balance a bit, makes me less offensive, and gives me minus two from my next... Mod modifier is for damage. And No, it's hitting. What is it? Damage as well. I can't remember. I'll look that up in a bit. Uh, bu 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 Modifier. Uh, modifier for Yeah, 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 yeah. Um. No, no, it's not for the damage, it's just for the attack. Okay, good to know. Right. So, as I am still alive, I can now spin sideways and use the winged horse kick. I will do that because I'm not going to try for the punch. Uh, not going to try for the throw, because that ain't going to work. So, kicking it is. So, this is something that is generally considered bad in fights, which is to turn your back on the enemy, but it's more of a side turn. You spin and drive the outside of your foot towards the ogre's purple-veined throat as it tries to swat you aside of its hammer. So I'm immediately noting that the punch is more effective against the ogre than the kick. Interesting. So, this time, however, 2d6 minus 2, because I blocked. An 8 is higher than a 5, and the kick does 1d6 plus 2 damage. If I'm not mistaken. Yes. That is correct. That is a hefty 6 damage. The ogre is now very badly wounded indeed. However, it now tries to bludgeon you in my head with its heavy hammer. My defense against this blow is 7, so actually, I'm better off just punching the ogre continuously. Uh, 5 is less than 8, so that is not a hit. I'm going in for the punch. Might be able to finish him off with a single blow to the throat here. Once again, the clenched fist audibly parts the air, and we make Bruce Lee noises, which are awesome, apparently. Yes, a 9 is higher than a 4. I'll do 1d6 damage. Watch as I roll like a 2 now, you know. Nope, nope, 4 is good enough. The ogre is felled. Awesome. Ah. Oh. Having defeated the ogre, I now turn to 360. Uh, if I'm if I seem to be rushing a little, I'm aware that I'm trying for a shorter episode, and I don't want to lag too much. So I do want to fit things in. The ogre buckles at my knees and topples backwards between the two ships. A plume of spray rises from where he plummets into the water. If you have used a shuriken, it is lost with the ogre. Looking quickly around, you can see that the reavers, with their earrings and scimitars, are more than a match for the crew of the aquamarine. Glavis's swordsmanship is startling, but they are slowly penning him in. With a punishing sidekick, you knock a new attacker to the floor where he lies inert. Another huge, wart-faced half-orc lunges at you with his cutlass. With incredible speed, you clap your hands together, trapping the blade between them inches from your face. He has time to gape in astonishment before you smash the top of your right foot into his temple. Will you try to fight your way through to Glavis, or join the Reaver's ship to attack the pirate captain? Right. Glavis is a good swordsman. He's being overwhelmed. If we can fell the pirate captain quickly, we'll demoralize them and they're going to stop fighting. I'd like to go help him, but I seem to recall that we're better off just going straight for the pirate captain. So I'll do that. 3.52. Okay. You run a few steps along the aquamarine's deck before leaping the rail and landing against the side of a pirate ship, hanging from the scuppers by your hands. You wait for a moment before edging your way, hand over hand, towards the red stern of the watery grave. 
Make a fate roll to see if one of Reavers spotted you jumping from your ship. Uh, fate is... It's, gonna, it's around a seven, isn't it? It's Where's the... Da, 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 da. Seven is lucky, six is unlucky. Okay, so, two dice. That's an eleven. We are fortunate this day. 107. Okay. You swing up over the rail unseen and run up the stairway to the stern castle from where the pirate captain is directing his men. You're, you bound up the last steps to appear from nowhere behind him. He steps back in surprise but soon regains his composure. He is a large man with a grizzled beard and gold armbands which cause the veins of his massive arms to stand out like cords. He swings his morning star at you as you move into attack. Which move will you use? The leaping tiger kick, the cobra strike punch, or the teeth of the tiger throw? Which one's teeth of the tiger again? And, 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 Windows is doing that annoying thing where, for some reason, you have to close all the windows to get back to the one to Windows Explorer, otherwise it won't let you just switch to it. Annoying, I know. Uh, so, wait. Teeth of the Tiger is the weird head one. I'm going to go for that because it's really unusual, unexpected, and he won't be used to it at all, I hope. Make a note of how many times you try to hit the reaver. Oh, bollocks. Ducking beneath the flailing chain and ball, you climb into the air and try to clamp your feet around his neck and, by twisting vigorously, throw him into the sea! Yeah, this is the auto-kill move. This is one that ends the fight immediately if we pull it off, because he's off the ship. His defence against the throw is a six. So... Fingers crossed here. Seven! It's higher than a six! It's a seven! If you have successfully thrown him, he is whipped over the edge of the stern castle and into the sea! I'm, I'm not even going to... I mean, we'll see. I, I'm not even going to put his uh, health down just yet. 34. Crash! The captain's head hits the deck on the way down and his skull is staved in before the waves engulf him. Auto-kill move complete. The news spreads quickly through the reavers and bra break off the battle, jumping back to the watery death and begin fighting in earnest to decide who shall become the new tyrant captain. You dive from the stern castle and swim strongly towards the Akmarin, which is already underway. Your lungs bursting, you catch onto a moving oar at last and haul yourself up over the side. Let's hope Glavis is okay and let's hope he doesn't mind too much that we left him there in his moment of hardship. By midday of the next day, the Akumarin has left the islands behind, and ahead of you looms the greater continent. Oh, we also have a map of orbs somewhere, don't we? Um, we do, yes. Oh, this is the new map. Um, so the island of plenty is like down here somewhere, and we're coming in this way, or are we coming in up here? Uh, where's the old map? Uh, Ah, there we are. So, if I play zoom in a little bit, I think we're coming in this way towards Doom Over, and then we're going to want to head up towards, was it Quench Heart Keep? I think it was. Or we're coming in down here and working way up, no, but I think we are coming in at Doom Over. By midday of the next day, the Aquamarine has left the islands behind, and ahead of you looms the greater continent. You turn north and hug the rocky coast for some days. You may restore up to ten points of less en lost endurance as you rest. You know what? I would love to restore up to 10 points of lost endurance, but I'm on full health as it is. I aced that ogre fight and the pirate captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Suck, suck it in now. I won't be so lucky next time. 
It begins to rain slightly on the next day as you follow the shore of a vast bay. Glavis comes to talk to you and points to a large estuary where the grey bones empties into the sea. He tells you that his home city, Tor, lies upriver. You ask him whether there is a temple to Quan there, and he shakes his head, but freely tells you that his goddess is the All-Mother, preserver of life, another word name I see. You ask him of the cities which lie around beyond Tor on the Greybones River, but a look of pain crosses his face. Let me tell you instead, that was it, that was it, a kind of crap Sean Barrett impersonation which sounded barely nothing like him. Let me tell you instead of Doomover, for that is our port of call, he says. It is one of the largest cities in the Man March, perhaps four hundred thousand souls, and it is ruled by the Legion of the Sword of Doom. Most spit when they hear the name, but they are one of the best armies in Orb. They worship the war god Vash Ro. Not a word name! I'm so proud. He who sows for the reaper, and they spread fear about them in battle. There are temples to other gods, but the cathedral of the war god overshadows them all. The marshal of the Legion of the Sword of Doom is Honoric, a black heart who has never been defeated in combat. Remember this, Honoric has never been defeated in combat. Which means, if we go up against him, we want to try and find some way that involves not fighting him. It is said that he once slew a storm giant single-handed. He is without doubt a peerless swordsman. The Order of the Scarlet Mantis has a temple there too. They send their acolytes to the far snows for training, where they become used to hardship of all kinds. So again, we have the free uh, warrior monk orders. We have the, the White Way of Quan, the Scarlet Mantis, and the the monks of the Black Scorpion, who are... Uh, the Black Scorpion are like the evil ninjas, the, the Scarlet Mantis are the neutral ones, and the Quan ninjas are the good ones. It's a little simplistic, but it works. And you know what? In terms of world building, it's all we need to know for now, right? Yeoman is the greatest warrior they have ever had to lead them. They use the Cross of Avatar, the supreme principle of good, as a symbol, but with a serpent twining around it. In this way, you may know one if you see one. And that will be worth remembering, probably. Also, I didn't think Glavis had a shaved head with a little ponytail on top. That's a little bit of a surprise. On the next day, you see the fortified harbour walls... Well, it's a surprise because he wasn't really mentioned in his description when we met him in the first place. It's like, oh, that's unusual. Okay, you yeah. know. On the next day, you sight the fortified harbour walls of Doomover, and two long blackwood ships dart out to meet you. They fly the flag of the Barbican, the Doomover Navy. Navy. As they approach, a tall man in black-ringed mail orders you to heave to. The captain obeys, and the sails are slackened. He answers various questions, but when the naval commander asks what business he has in Doomover, he looks nervously at Glavis, licking his lips. Glavis answers for him, saying that he has come to sell galley slaves. The commander grins. I was going to confiscate your ship, but as you bring men we have need of, you may pass through the Barbican. With that, you are allowed on your way. The Barbican itself is a huge gatehouse, like a fort, which spans the ends of the harbour walls in an arc. The ship glides beneath it and is tied up at the busy wharf. You thank Glavis for his help and jump lively to the land. He is returning to Tor to organise the defences against, against the forces of Vile, should your mission fail. He throws you a pouch containing ten gold pieces, saying, Here, you need this. May fate smile on you, ninja. I'm a ninja. I'm in plain clothes. I'm trying to blend in with the crowd. You just called me ninja in public. There better not be too many dot workers about or word will spread. You pocket the pouch and turn to the city, which means I am writing this down. We have money. Uh, don't have a specific space for it yet, so I'm just going to put down... Um, I'm sure I will have good use of them soon. 
two gates stand side by side. The larger is a huge arch of black obsidian like a rainbow of dark glass. The other, much smaller, consists of two pairs of white marble pillars, topped by a portico on which the words Portal of the Gods are written in gold leaf. Which gate will you choose to go through? The obsidian gate or the portal of the gods? Right. The obsidian gate is large and ominous. The portal of the gods is small and less ostentatious. I am playing a religious character so I believe the portal of the gods to be safer. However, will this give away my calling? I will use the portal of the gods on this occasion and hope that Quan looks down upon me kindly. As you step between the pillars of white marble, a voice speaks as if from the stones. Welcome to the sanctuary. Draw no swords here. You can't see anyone nearby, but ahead of you, a huge young warrior clad in russet and grey is crawling painfully up the steps of a temple. A priest in yellow robes comes out to help him, but as he leans down, a mounted knight in a black circle rides up the temple steps and lops the priest's head off. Another priest casts a spell. The horse rears backwards, and then two other horsemen wearing the same coat of arms, a silver sword hanging by a silver thread on a black background, ride up and take the reins from their friend. He curses the young warrior in a rage, but seems helpless as they lead him past you and gallop out through the marble gate. Priests carry their decapitated colleague and the young warrior who has left a trail of blood on the steps into the temple. So this man was wounded and crawling up to, to safety. A priest came out to help him and one of the men who had wounded him came riding after him and cut off the priest's head. Then the priest come out, cast a spell on him. It's like no weapons to be used here. Bloody hell. As they do so, a wizened, stooped old man with a necklace of crystal which clicks as he sways croaks, I foretold it, but did you heed me, Vizier? No! Will Beatan the free smile on you now, false priests? He turns and shuffles towards a small wooden chapel. The dead priest served Beatan, whose followers seek to bring nearer paradise on orb by living lives of capricious goodness, mocking all laws, but constrict the free spirit. Will you follow the priest into the temple Beatan, the free, free? Leave the sanctuary and pass through the obsidian gate, or follow the old man who claimed to be a seer? I will follow the old man because... Less witnesses. If I go into the temple with lots of priests, um... Yeah, they, they might be able to talk to me and give me some information. If I go to follow this old man, I can find out the validity of his claim, of the validity of his, of his claim, rather. So, 36. Yeah. Because he's one person, right? And in the temple there may be many people. There might be people where he's going, but I know there's more than one priest going back into the temple, and there's only the one old man. The seer is shuffling towards a porch at the entrance of a small wooden chapel that lies between the temple, beyond the temple to Beatan the Free. He turns towards you and beckons you inside. The chapel is small and dark, but to your surprise it is clean and well kept. Scrolls are neatly stacked in racks along the walls. The old man calls a girl's name and his acolyte appears, a surprisingly pretty girl of no more than eighty seasons. Uh, oh god, so, um, 20 years old? Right, got it, no more than 20. Whilst you wonder what she is doing with this stooped old man in a chapel that is too small to hold more than 20 people, he produces a long and wicked-looking sacrificial knife. In the darkness of the chapel, his features look more gaunt and powerful than they did when he raved at the priests. He tells you to lie down on what looks like a small marble tomb with a silver ewer beside it. The young girl reaches to guide you. If you trust them and allow her to guide you, if you decide to take your leave hastily, I will trust them. This looks like such a blatant... It, you know, if they wanted to kill me, they would do something far more significant than that. A ewer is a vessel, like a 
something that blood would drip into. I don't think they want all my blood, right? I think they might want a little bit of some of it, and maybe they can use it to see my future. Or give me guidance. I will trust them, and I may regret this. The girl takes your hands in hers and leads you to the marble slab. The old man explains that he must let some of your blood into the silver chalice if he is to show you the future. He cuts a vein in your arm and the blood pumps into the ewer. You look at him in alarm as he lets it flow until you have lost half a pint and your arm begins to tingle. Subtract two from your endurance. Absolutely. I mean, that's only reasonable given the circumstances, right? Then he seals the wound with a spell. How generous of him. The girl pours a green potion into the ewer. You feel faint and obey him when he tells you to look at the mirror which hangs on the wall above him. He begins to chant and produces a crystal prism which he holds over the ewer. The blood and potion bubble and the seer's chanting grows louder. A picture forms in the mirror of two men leaving a city on horseback. The larger is dressed in black plate mail and carries a black shield upon which is emblazoned a silver sword hanging from a silver thread. The Sword of Doom. His face is arrogant and cruel. Oh my god, the sword hanging from the thread, I've just... That ties into something later on, which I'll, I'll, I'll bring up when it happens towards the end of the adventure, if I get that far. His face is arrogant and cruel. The other is dressed in the clothes of a martial arts monk, Scarlet with a thin black belt. They are riding towards you in silence, and the monk's piercing black eyes gaze unwaveringly into yours. The seer informs you that the vision shows Yemen, Grand Master of Flame, riding with Honoric, Marshal of the Legion of the Sword of Doom, north from Mort Avalon. He tells you they are travelling to the Pillars of Change, each to speak a word which will imprison a god and a goddess in Inferno. Honoric seeks to rule the whole of the man-march. You fall into a trance, and when you wake up, you find yourself outside Doomover, walking on the road to Mort Avalon. You wonder what the seer may have done whilst you were entranced. Has he told anyone of your vision? At any rate, the vision suggested that Honoric and Yemen were far ahead. You realize that you must travel to Mort Avalon to find out where Honoric and Yemen are. So, we've skipped potentially a whole lot of dangerous stuff in the city right there. And go to section 65. Now, there may have been some vital clues or items or evidence that we needed in the city, but I think we've made it safely through here, and that's good enough, okay? As you leave the forbidding towered walls of doom over behind, the sun climbs in the sky, ripening the corn and barley which rustles in the breeze. The fields do not stretch that far, and you are soon on the edge of a low plain, the Plain of Feet. Another word name. On which the several thousand of the Legion of the Sword of Doom, smart and efficient, are practicing for, a f for the forthcoming war. The smooth plain gradually gives way to a wilderness of trees and vines. Will you continue along the road to Mort Avalon, or strike north of the road into the wilderness? Um... Hmm. So, we are on the road between Doomover and Mort Avalon. So, we're heading northeast, heading north into the wilderness. Um, I think for now, sticking to the road is probably the best idea. I think. But I'm not sure. Right. We do not overtly know that there are a great many enemies in our path actively seeking us out. So we do not have a reason to go north into the wilderness and travel off-road. I'm going to stay on the road for now. Now, this is an interesting one. Stay on the road or go north off the road. Normally going north is good. But, there is no direction given along the road, so it's on the road or off the road. So, on the road for now, it is. 
Oh, I just remembered something. There, there might have been a very good reason to go off-road. Oh, well. Ah, glad I stayed on the road, actually. <laughs> you trot along the road, passing the occasional traveller on horseback or on foot, and an occasional trading caravan gathering berries and nuts at the side of the road as you go. You sleep away from the road. You may restore up to two endurance and continue on, hoping to reach Mort Avalon at dusk on the second day. Hey, guess what? I'm feeling better again. The road winds upwards into a range of hills which encircle the city of Mort Avalon, and it is afternoon when you hear a strange hissing and a sudden scream around the corner ahead. You move steadily forwards to see a black-skinned man with the swaying neck and head of a cobra tethered to a wagon on which there is a large cage. The cobra man has grabbed a young boy and is about to kill him. The two men who are on the wagon look too terrified to do anything. Will you leave the young boy to his fate or run and kick the Cobra Man? I'm going to run and kick the Cobra Man. Look at that Cobra Man. It's like he could have been out of a He-Man series or, or um, Thundercats or something from the 1980s. Yeah, he's a man with a snake's head and it's a cobra's head as well. So you get the big cobra hood flaring out. Yeah, I'm going to go run, fight that Cobra Man. Save the young child, because to be fair, the child is probably reasonably innocent and not like some evil scumbag who needs to be killed or something. The Cobra Man looks up as you launch yourself into a flying, leaping tiger kick. The Cobra Man can strike with the speed of a snake, however, and his defense against your kick is six. All right. 2d6, here we go. Seven is higher than a six. If you hit the Cobra Man, we absolutely did. 227. Now that is action. Sorry, it's just, I was playing a really fast-paced game with a mate earlier, and um, I'm kind of all so... The Cobra Man hisses, squirming at the end of his leash as the boy escapes to safety whilst the Cobra Man was distracted. The two men, hulking fat brutes who resemble the ox which pulls their wagon, tell you they are taking the Cobra Man to the zoo in Mort Avalon. We found him living alone in a cave not far up the hill there, says one, pointing to a dark hole in the hills overhung with rock. We didn't even, we didn't dare venture too far in, but there's treasure to be had, I'll warrant. With that, they whip the ox onward, dragging the hissing cobra man behind them. The boy, sitting on the back of a wagon, calls, Thank you for saving me! Don't shake hands with the young magician! The men laugh, and you are left to ponder the meaning of his strange words. Will you overtake the ox cart and go straight to Mort Avalon or enter the cave? Right, first off, I am making a note of 227. Don't shake hands with the young magician. That's an important clue for later on. Those of you who've played this book before will maybe know exactly what I'm referring to. I'm going to go to the cave and try and find that treasure. Because they've given me a nice clue. It could be a trap. We got there, we could get captured or fall through a pit in the floor or something nasty. Uh, go straight to Mort Avalon. Wait, yeah, what if... Mm. So, memory here, right? What if they aren't taking the snake man, the cobra man to Mort Avalon, but are actually taking him away from what's in the cave. And if what's in the cave is what I thought was in Mort Avalon, oh dear. Let's go to the cave and find out, shall we? Yeah. And that picture there, which, yeah, let's have Honorick in bed, sword hanging by a thread. Just remember that for if we get to see that picture in a future episode. The cave is dark, but light filters down into it from a narrow crack in the ceiling. As you inch your way along the uneven floor, you hear footsteps behind you and hurry on into the darkness. Steps lead down, and, as you descend, a curious noise like the grinding of metal cogs sounds above. Suddenly a torrent of water cascades down the steps, and you run on through the darkness, feeling the wall with your hand. You are soon knee-deep and beginning to wonder if there is any way out at the end of the tunnel when a portcullis slams to the floor behind you. The level of the water drops and you find yourself trapped in an iron cage. Yeah. Yeah. That's not good. 
There is no escape, and you languish in the cage for some hours, using the time to relax and meditate. Suddenly, the cage is flooded with light, with, uh, with light as a door at the end of the tunnel is flung open. You are under the seats of a huge circular arena, which is slowly filling with people. The huge crowd cheers as a trumpet sounds, and the front of the cage collapses to the ground. A group of soldiers come to the back of the cage and motion you to step into the arena, poking spears to report colours. May fate smile on with you, says one. Only one of you can become the king of the castle and live. You step out into the sunlight to another cheer from the crowd, and the cage front is pulled up again behind you and you cannot go back. Squinting in the sun, you look, down, look around you. Turn to 261. Yeah! The floor of the arena is divided into sections. In the centre, a huge hobgoblin brandishing a trident stands at the top of a miniature castle, which is surrounded by a large moat. The circle outside the moat is divided into four sectors by fences of iron spikes. The, se the sector to your left is a small plain of grass. To your right is a frozen lake created magically. Beyond the plain is a lurid green swamp and between swamp and ice is a desert of sand dunes. You are standing on a platform between the grass and the ice. So grass, ice, sand dunes, swamp. And the mock castle in the middle. At the opposite side of the arena, a man in silver armour, his face hidden by his visor, stands on a similar platform. So we have a knight here. On the ice lake stands a snow giant, ten feet tall, two roaring lions. Roam the plate. Wait, have I? No. Ah. Skipped a sentence or two there. Right. At the opposite side of the arena, a man in silver armour, his face hidden by his visor, stands on a similar platform. Between you both, to your left, is a dark elf, waving her black steel sword defiantly, and at the edge of the arena to your right stands a young man in flowing blue and gold robes. On the ice lake stands a snow giant, ten feet tall. Two roaring lions roam the plain. You can see nothing but a boat in the swamp, and in the desert waits a man with a swaying head and neck of a cobra. As you look around you, the platform begins to slide down towards the ground and you will soon be within reach of the lions or the snow giant. Indeed, they can now move freely into each other's areas. The walls of the arena are sheer and lined with spear the spears of soldiers. The man in armour steps into the dunes as the dark elf wades into the swamp. Will you move to the plain and take your chances of the lions or step onto the ice lake? I'm not sure if this is repeated, but I'm going to make a note um, just in case I need to come back to it. And I think this might be... Right, do I want to call it here and be like, oh my god, I'm going to go into the arena and fight things, or do I want to handle everything in the arena and stop there? If I do stop here... I'm definitely going to be reading this whole section again at the start of the next episode. I don't mind that. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go onto the ice lake and then I think the sand dunes. I can't remember though for certain. Hmm. Yeah, I, I will call it here and, and rest my my tiring vocal cords. <laughs> I hope you've all enjoyed this episode, significantly shorter than the last one, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next one. I'll say bye-bye for now, and cheerio!